everybody. Uh, welcome to our ninth Climate Change Speaker Series for this year. It's our ninth presentation, and it's part two of the sea level rise and flooding um, topic that we've been talking about. Last month in part one, um, we heard from county experts, including Chris Chu, who has joined us today, um, about how Marin is directly involved uh, in identifying and assessing just how vulnerable Marin is to sea level rise and flooding, um, much due to climate change related storm events. And we're talking both on the coast and on the bay side. So last month we heard about that along with what San Rafael is uh, doing as far as uh, identifying in their uh, guidelines for planning to take into account sea level rise. So some of the jurisdictions are finally moving forward with uh, drawing guidelines so that they don't build where there's going to be water in years to come. So, but that water's coming. Uh, there's no doubt about it through sea level rise and storms. So this month, we're going to talk more about, okay, the water's coming. How do we adapt to that and live with rising waters? So with that, I'm going to toss this over to Linda, and she's going to introduce today's program and speakers. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Warren Chabot, Chabot, who is the executive director of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. It's an environmental science research institute serving Bay Area resource management agencies and NGOs. He brings over 30 years of executive experience in the private, public, and nonprofit sector focused on science-based environmental planning and policy issues. Warner has specialized in California coast, ocean, water, land use, and energy issues at the local, state, and federal level. Between managing his own environmental consulting firm, Warner has also served as a CEO of the California League of Conservation Voters. Prior to that, Warner was vice president of Ocean Conservancy, a national ocean policy organization. So with that, thank you, Warner, for joining us, and it's all yours. Thank you. Um, I'm, I don't see on, on the screen, so, okay, you put it up, so thank you. Um, I wanna start on a personal note. In two weeks, uh, my wife and I are gonna be going to Glasgow on our own dime to attend the Climate Summit. We're attending as nonprofit ob observers. One message that I intend to share with as many people as possible is this, and that is that the San Francisco Bay Area has the potential to be a national, if not international model for how a region of 8 million people at the edge of the sea tackles the challenge of climate change and sea level rise. My presentation today provides a glimpse of how we are taking on that challenge with nature-based solutions here in the Bay Area. As was said in the introduction, the San Francisco Estuary Institute, SFEI for short, is a science think tank and nonprofit environmental consulting institute. We served the Northern California region for about 26 years, primarily in the San Francisco Bay and Delta area. The issues that impact us are regional, but most land use decisions are made at the at the site or the city or the county level. Next. Next. Thank you. Basically, we're 8 million people, literally soon to be 10 million people, literally in a bathtub. Um, we face a triple challenge. Uh, the climate adaptation challenge in the Bay Area is unique to California. Um, it is both dealing with sea level rise, rising groundwater and lowland flooding from more extreme storms. Next. We can have a future for the Bay Area that looks something like this. Next. Uh, unless we take rather dramatic actions in this decade, however, our future is gonna look a lot more like this. Next. However, by adapting and using nature-based solutions, we can take advantage of the spectacular natural resources that are at our doorstep and have a future that looks a lot more like this for many portions of the Bay Area. Next. The San Francisco Bay has a complex and varied shoreline along about 400 miles of diverse land uses, infrastructure, and communities with diverse physical processes. Everything that we depend upon for our daily existence our freeways, our airports, our wastewater treatment system lies within a fragile zone at the edge of the bay. Next. 
Like all estuaries, it's a mixing zone where the hills meet the water, where the tides rush into a place, washed around and come back out. Our fragile shoreline is influenced by ocean processes like sea level rise that also creates rising, rising groundwater levels along much of the shoreline of the bay. Reduced sediment from the, the, the delta um, is reducing the amount of sediment that builds up and protects and restores our wetlands to help them maintain the buffer, critical buffer that provide for many shoreline areas. Increased lowland flooding from more intense storms combined with drought effect events uh, creates the added um, complexity of climate change issues that we have to deal with. So again, the, the triple whammy of sea level rise, rising groundwater and extreme storm flooding, uh, extreme flooding from lowland storms is, is unique to the Bay Area and it's probably the fundamental climate adaptation challenge that we face. Next. This chart shows um, you know, the anticipated uh, sea level rise uh, globally. Uh, it shows that um, in about 10 years from now, about 2030, sea level rise is expected to accelerate. For the Bay Area, we're looking at, at clearly the possibility of up to six feet, if not more, of sea level rise by the end of this century. And it's not gonna stop there. It's gonna keep going along, along that curve. So for the Bay Area, this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, political, economic, social, and ecological challenge that our, our children and grandchildren are gonna face and that we owe it to them to do something about it now. Next. Uh, this uh, SFEI map shows predicted sea level rise impacts uh, around the Bay uh, shoreline. Our Bay shoreline has about $100 billion in economic assets at risk from these threats. A recent study by USGS said of all the shoreline assets along the entire coast of California, the outer coast and San Francisco Bay, two thirds of the assets, economic assets at risk statewide are within San Francisco Bay with a heavy emphasis on assets at risk in San Mateo and Marin County shoreline. That's one reason that we provided the science for a regional Bayland goals report. That report set a regional goal to protect 100,000 acres of wetlands to provide the most cost-effective nature-based buffer against bay waters rising. It was a foundation for the, a, a, bond, a tax measure in 2016 that raised a half a billion dollars for wetlands restoration at $25 million a year over 20 years. That bond, that, that tax measure that covered nine counties was literally the nation's first regional tax measure to fund climate adaptation programs. Next. Next, please. We recognize that nature doesn't care about the boundaries of your port, your city, or your county. Um, with your permission, however, I'm gonna get a little technical now to try to define Find better the, the, the problem and the challenge that we face. Uh, uh, there we go, okay, next. Next, please. The Bay Area really has three fundamental uh, landscapes. This map is color-coded. Uh, you know, for, for the red areas is the steepest slopes that are red. Medium slopes are in orange. The low-lying areas are in blue. If you look at the south portion, the once agricultural breadbasket of Santa Clara County has pumped their groundwater for over 100 years. That resulted in dropping the elevation of much of Santa Clara County by over six, six feet, and many places it's wow. below sea level. <clears throat> This, is, this shows like the steep headlands um, around uh, Tiburon and, and Belvedere. Next. Um, go, go, go next. This shows the eastern shoreline, which is sort of called alluvial plains that um, benefit from sediment that comes down through the watershed and the creeks to build up those wetlands, but that sediment now is being trapped behind dams and causing a significant challenge to the maintenance of wetlands along the eastern shore uh, of San Francisco Bay. Next. Well, that's just kind of the curving area of the alluvial plain and the urban areas with the wetlands um, out in front of them. Next, please. 
this is just a comparison showing the the steep headland areas in in you know like Sausalito and in Tiburon, the medium slant sloping areas of alluvial plains along the eastern shore of the bay, and the um, alluvial valleys that are both in the southern portion and Silicon Valley, as well as much of the northern portion. Next. This is looking south, um, kind of bird's eye view with Hayward to the left, San Jose in the middle, um, Santa Clara Valley um, to, the, to the right. Um, and it, it shows that portion of, of, of Santa Clara Valley, much of which is subsided and is being protected by a series of, of levees that are being built to um, maintain the wetlands at, at the edge of, of the bay and, and uh, much of the area from like Hayward up through um, Palo Alto. Next. At the abs absolute opposite end of the northern portion of the bay, um, this is um, looking east from Nevado along Highway 37 towards Vallejo, another very low lying area that's um, heavily endangered by um, rising seas and rising groundwater. Next. Now, much of the Bay Area's shoreline, especially in the southern and northern regions, is buffered by wetlands. These are going to drown over the next 50, 80 years due to um, accelerating sea level rise and a depleted supply of sediment that usually um, helps build the wetlands to rise up as the seas rise. That process has now been a challenge by accelerating sea level rise and a declining supply of sediment. So those wetlands are likely to drown unless we take dramatic and bold action. Next. Many areas of the segments of the bay shoreline are protected by levees, like this one on the eastern part of the bay around uh, Hayward. Next. However, this is what this levee uh, looks like during high tide with storm surges, and this is what the future um, looks like for the for many areas of, of the Bay Area. Next. Um, keep in mind, if we're going to try to tackle uh, sea level rise in and around the Bay Area, we need to um, address the, the the fact that we have over nine counties, 100 cities, and many frontline communities in low-lying areas, and many of those frontline communities are under-resourced um, and um, underserved communities and disadvantaged uh, communities. So, so the, the challenge of climate change in the Bay Area means the need to try to coordinate among all of these entities so that we are collaborating. And one of the challenges is that the reality is that you know 90% of climate adaptation fundamentally is land use planning and 90% of land use planning still occurs at the city and county level. Next. So what we tried to do at, at SFEI in conjunction with, um, with others has to been to try to divide the Bay Area into um, uh, you know, 30 segments. We called them, we used a Dutch term from Dutch planning for sea level rise called Operational Landscape Units, or OLUs. Next. We produced the, um, the San Francisco Bay Adaptation Atlas to specifically look at nature-based science for climate adaptation. Next. In the atlas, we tried to provide kind of a place-based specific framework for local government officials to use to deal with nature-based solutions. We want to work with nature to adapt to sea level rise. We want to not just pray at the altar of nature-based solutions. We recognize that both nature and hybrid infrastructure solutions might be necessary, but we believe that in many, many cases, nature-based solutions are less expensive and more effective policy options that can span multiple jurisdictions and allow stakeholders to develop effective adaptation strategies. Next. We looked at a wide range of shoreline characteristics from tidal, you know, tidal range, tidal surge, wind wave heights, shoreline composition. Next. We looked at the historic baylands, the current baylands, elevation situations, and options that we have for wetlands restoration, which is one of the key um, necessary nature-based solutions. Next. We also looked at the infrastructure that it's at, at risk from sea level rise and rising groundwater, our ports, our landfills, our airports, our pipelines, our wastewater plants. Next. 
We also looked at both. The left-hand column is a series of nature-based adaptation measures. The right-hand column is a series of either regulatory or policy options that could be used to address the challenge of climate adaptation. Next. Some nature-based solutions include um, restoring oyster beds around the edge of the bay or developing horizontal levees, more, more gentle, gradual sloping levees that, that um, will help to buffer and slow um, storm surges and, and provide additional protections uh, along much of the eastern shoreline of, of the bay. Next. Warren, I just want to let you know you've got about two minutes, but Perfect. you can take more if you need it. That's okay. Um, among those, you know, probably the most one of the most significant options is marsh restoration, restoring the wetlands um, and building them up so they keep pace with sea level rise around the edge of the bay. Next. So the benefits of nature-based adaptation are, are multiple. It provides clean water, provides flood risk management, improves the food web and creates habitat for wildlife. Um, in turn, that provides many opportunities for uh, public recreation and scenery. We're an urban uh, region of 8 million people, soon to be 10 million people with a bay right at our, our footsteps. How can we kind of maximize the recreational opportunities there? Nature-based solutions in many, many cases are gonna cost less and be more adaptable over time. Next. In this report, we took every one of these, we took about 10 different nature-based solutions and, and compared them and applied them across 30 different segments of the shoreline to say, where would it be you know, most suitable to be applied? Is it limited suitability, some suitability or high suitability? Next. We then produced in the adaptation atlas for each of the 30 segments of shoreline, a kind of an opportunities map. It's not a blueprint, it's not a land use plan, but it's an opportunities map for local planners, be they in Corte Madera or Redwood City or Hayward or Sunnyvale would have an ability to look at the, the most likely range of nature-based solutions that might work for that segment of, of the shoreline that would be applicable. We did this in producing this atlas, we worked with BCDC, we worked with Marin County, San Mateo County, and as a result of, of their involvement, the, the, the atlas we produced has been embraced by the, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, as well as the Metropolitan Plan, um, Transportation Commission and ABAG for use in their planning to look at regional solutions. Next. And I'm wrapping up here. So what it means, some of the results of this effort with the Adaptation Atlas is that we, we need to be exploring ways of finding and producing and distributing additional sedi sediment so that we build up our wetlands, they keep pace with sea level rise. We need to probably do a better job of integrating our, our water system issues and our green infrastructure and to develop sort of adaptation pathways within each, each region and segment along the shoreline. But to do it in collaboration across jurisdictions and um, across larger regions. Next. So if you want a copy of, um, of the Adaptation Atlas, it is online. It's a, it's, a, it's a great resource. It's about a 300 page document. It has a map of almost every natural resource issue that we could, could um, identify and map. Um, next. I'll stop there. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give you a, a sort of a quick tour of nature-based solutions and what we tried to do with the Adaptation Atlas to make those solutions available to cities, counties, and community groups that are working to find solutions along the shoreline of the bay. Thank you. Wow, that was great. Even I could understand what you say, and it's scary. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> But it's so good to see all the work that's being put into this, that people are being proactive on it and, uh, and all. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, Bruce Ackerman, would you like to pose your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, excellent work. Thank you so much, Warner. Um, I have a specific question about uh, dirt. You actually covered it at the end that you mentioned at the end that uh, in order to build up the shoreline, you need the fill to do that. We, uh, something else we might be hearing about later today is the necessity in, uh, in other areas to build 
detention basins to take a lot of soil out and, uh, and create detention basins. And one of the biggest challenges of detention basins, not the only one, but one of the big ones is where to put all of the uh, fill that gets taken out. Would that type of fill be suitable for, uh, for, the, for what you're talking about along the shoreline? Or is that just not the same kind of? No, no, the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, one recent study that a, a very brilliant gentleman that uh, did a PhD at, at, at Berkeley uh, concluded that the amount of soil that we remove from construction projects alone in the Bay Area is equal to all of the sediment that flows down through the streams to, to, to restore the wetlands. So there's a, a vast need for sediment. One of the challenges is that in many places um, that sediment has a high level of contamination. So in short, we can find and, and need to kind of come up with probably government and financing solutions to make sure that much of that sediment that usually gets dug up for construction projects around the Bay Area gets taken to landfills when we desperately need it in, in wetlands. So once it's tested to make sure that it doesn't have, you know, a high levels of, of contamination, then absolutely. But we need to kind of, we're going to need to come up with a, a set of, you know, policy incentives and financing to make sure that we get that sediment from construction sites and retention basins um, out to the wetlands. Moving dirt out into the wetlands is not a cheap uh, uh, a process, but the short answer to your question is yes. Thank you. And then we have a question from Herb, is it Beerstock? Um, could you revisit and comment on the slide with two columns of the many options for nature-based solutions and regulatory solutions? What's the status of the applications and prospects for scaling up to these measures in the coming three to 10 years? Good question. I don't have control over the slides um, and I'm not sure which slide that was, it was in the middle. Um, but you know, I, I would ask that what, um, someone who's in control or I, I, I will put something on, on the, 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 the last, the second to last slide had the link to our website, which has the full adaptation atlas. But and that is posted to, in our chat. Um, Lynn posted okay. that in our chat room. So. Okay. Well, that'll take you to the website. There's a lot of information on that site, including the document itself that can be uh, downloaded. Um, but we, I mean, we looked at, like I said, about 10 or 12 nature-based solutions. We also looked at recognizing, um, you know, regulatory and, and you know, um, called gray infrastructure solutions. In some cases, it's a hybrid. I would say what's happening along that front right now is that both the um, Bay Conservation and Development Commission has just released a plan called Bay Adapt that's been in the process for two years to try to come up with a platform for regional shoreline adaptation planning. And the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which has merged, is, is also part of ABAG, has produced a, a document called Plan Bay Area 2050 that also looks at the entire nine county region with a heavy emphasis on transportation and housing, but also a focus on climate adaptation. Those are two planning documents that both have, have are in their absolute like final final stages of, of adoption this very month and um, both provide sort of a, a platform and a, and a framework. In addition, in the governor's recent budget, the governor did allocate 3.7 billion dollars quote for climate resilience. Within that budget is 500 million dollars over two years to go to the California uh, Coastal Conservancy for shoreline uh, and you know, kind of shoreline restoration purposes. And 250 million is allocated for a fund that will go to cities and counties to do regional adaptation planning. And that was large part uh, led by, and those two efforts were pushed by people from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Assemblyman Kevin Mullen, who SFEI worked with on a bill to provide guidance to the governor's office of, of planning and research. So the, the in, in shorthand, 
the administration is putting a lot of money on the table over the next six months, entities like the Office of Planning and Research, the Strategic Growth Council, the Ocean Protection Council will develop guidelines for distributing this money. So as of like spring and early summer of next year, there will be um, the ability for cities and counties to be applying for grants to do the type of multi-agency, multi-jurisdiction pilot projects or, or planning, either doing planning or actual implementation efforts to jumpstart the regional climate adaptation process that the Bay Area desperately needs. Um, and what you were just referring to the different um, measures, was that AB 72? Are there, I know there were three things that were just signed off on um, from the state, AB 72, SB 1, and SB 27. Is well, um, Neither, not, not any of those. There was, there okay. was a, the state budget, there was, a, I think an SB 170 was the thing. I, I will try to send you a, a link that you could, um, I'm not sure if it's a link or not, but um, there is a, a um, I'll, I'll send you a couple of links to, to post up that shows the budget. That it's a one pager that lists like 22 line items um, over three years and how this $3.7 billion is to be allocated. Um, and, it, and I did a second document. I'm not sure I've got a, a link to it where I took those line items and linked them to all the, the, the budget legislation language, which is like 400 pages and it's like trying to read Sanskrit. But there is a considerable amount of, of funds that are available and I'll try to post something on, on the chat when I, when I stop yakking. That would be great. Thank you so much. Um, Annie Lazar is asked, um, Annie, why don't I um, ask you to ask the question um, so you can, so I don't screw it up. <laughs> Annie? Are you on mute, Annie? We can't hear anything. Okay. Um, uh. One of my specialties has been as a waterboard watcher uh, over, um, many years, and of course now we are preoccupied with drought, and I wonder about the the, uh, the fact that there will be many droughts in our future. Well, uh, certainly, uh, you know, yes, the, the, uh, you know, we're we've developed an entire water system that was based on a, a population of. You know, basically one million people in this in the state, um, one to two or three million people, and we're now at at, at forty million. Um, uh, we're also have developed an entire infrastructure over the last twenty years, uh, twenty to fifty years, uh, which has been frankly a rather wet phase in the history of, of of climatology. So we could be going into a very long, severe drought. There have been droughts of. of 10 years, 15 years historically um, in, in geologic history in, in, in California. Um, so we are facing the fact that we're gonna have um, in 2040, um, you know, 2 million more people in the Bay Area and, and maybe by the end of the century, uh, you know, 20% even less water, if, if not more. So um, there are efforts by the um, many, in, um, utilities around the Bay Area to look at ways of um, improving the um, either the recycling of water or um, uh, you know more efficient use of water. So the Bay Area needs to look at a very comprehensive program um, that um, takes water into account. Um, I think the the Regional Water Board is um, in the San Francisco Bay Area Regional Water Board is being uh, providing a lot of leadership in that area. Uh, the San Francisco Estuary Institute is doing a, a study along with um, many of the um, uh, utilities in the Bay Area. With San Francisco Bay, we, we face a bizarre problem in the fact that um, the amount of, the Bay has always been for like a hundred years rather cloudy because of sediment that's drifted down from the Sierras based on um, hydraulic mining that we did in the 18, late 1800s. That sediment has now finally settled down and the bay has gotten more clear. 
That sounds like good news. Unfortunately, more clear <laughs> means sunlight gets um, further down into means more sunlight in the water and, and more nutrients washing off of our lawns and streets into the bay that creates the potential for algal blooms in the, in the bay. So the, the water treatment plants need to come up with a solution of either, I call it the five to $10 billion fork in the road. Either they install five to $10 billion of equipment to filter out the, the amount of nutrients going into the bay to reduce the food supply that would create algal blooms or five to $10 billion into um, recycling uh, water programs. Now, recycling sounds like great, who wouldn't be for recycling, but stop and think East Bay mud, if you're gonna recycle water from the water treatment plant that's right near the toll plaza of the Bay Bridge, you take that water, you've got to pump it back up to a reservoir, meaning you're gonna to have to build a pipeline you know, from Emeryville through you know, the urban areas of Oakland and Berkeley back up to that reservoir. That's a huge in investment cost. So, you know, recycling sounds good. And in many cases it is, but it's also, you know, we're, we're, we're for the Bay Area to deal with the challenge of climate change in the Bay Area, we're probably going to have to invest a hundred billion dollars over the next 20, 30 years. And we need to make some really big investments in the next 10 years. So we have some very huge political, economic policy challenges in the Bay Area to deal with this issue. And we have probably a 10 year window to do some very bold um, thinking and action as gonna require some, some really strong leadership from our local, state and, and federal officials. I'm also wondering about the way drought changes the geography, so. I, I, I don't, well, one of the ways that the, the drought changes the geography is a, it, it even reduces to a greater level the amount of sediment that's flowing down the streams into the the wetlands. Um, it, um, it uh, you know, um, so I, I don't think it you know it, it's it, it's greater effects is is less on the geography, more on increasing fire hazards, um, um, you know, creating you know. Um, other challenges, but I don't think significant on, on geography. That we, in the past, um, you know, we over pumped the groundwater basins in what was like the agricultural breadbasket of Santa Clara Valley and caused the entire Santa Clara Valley to, um, to sink um, six to eight feet. They've been, you know, over the last 25, 30 years, they've been trying to deal with that and gradually, you know, um, kind of stabilizing and uh, the, the situation. So I, I don't think we're likely to see more, you know, um, overdrafting of, of, of uh, the, the groundwater basin in, in Santa Clara Valley. Our biggest mm -hmm. challenge really is just the fact that sea level rise is also pushing up groundwater. So even if you build a dike or a levee, you still might have slushy um, uh, mm. land on, on the inland side uh, because of rising seas, raising the the groundwater under San Francisco Airport, under the Bayshore Freeway, under the 880, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all for the moment, unless somebody else has more to say. I think Lynn did make it, Lynn Dooley made the comment of that it's a wonderful presentation and thank you so much. And I think most of us echo, if not all of us echo that same sentiment, so. Yeah. Nancy, you. do you have anything else to ask before we go to Stuart? Uh, again, Warner, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Uh, you introduced a whole nother wealth of scary information. <laughs> and thank you so much. And we'd love to hear if you had time when you get back from your trip to the climate meetings uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, we're fingers crossed, toes crossed, whatever is things, good things come out of that. And so thank you for going. Thank you. I, I will post, I'll, I'll go, I'll try to uh, find an online link to post some information about the budget uh, and, and the, the funds that might be available for both to um, under the, the 3.7 climate resilience budget. So I'll try to post a link to that. Okay. Thank you. We one, have another meeting to go to. Yeah. So, yeah. well, what, um, I spoke too soon. There is one 
uh -oh. uh, question that came in at the very end by Wandon Trenner. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Living on the shoreline along the Corte Madera Creek across from the ferry, Larkspur Ferry, some of us are trying to get traction for the bridge district to consider a living shoreline as mitigation for erosion caused by the ferry wake, which could also deal with flooding and sea level rise, but they don't appeal to want, appear to want to do it. Do you have any comments on that? I, I'm, I'm curious to say they don't appear to want to do it. I do think that there is um, a, a very high level of, of interest and sophisticated engagement um, by Marin County to look at um, shoreline areas. Um, I know that there is um, the the city of Corte Madera did do a a um, a plan. I see Stuart Siegel probably, who's been closer to that, probably has more information to to share about that. But I do think that um, the the planning department, the public works department in in Marin County, I think is very sophisticated and you know looking seriously at at a full range of creative solutions. Uh, both through the outer coast and along the shoreline of, of the bay. But you get into challenges that kind of Marin County is sort of like epitomizes many other cases, the, the need for better collaboration and coordination between the cities and the county. Um, cities are very reluctant to give up their authority around the, the entire country over land use planning. So many shoreline adaptation solutions require a, a three-way collaboration, cities, county regional agencies, you know, working in, in in concert to come up with with solutions. And they're they're not they're not cheap. And um, uh, that's why we're gonna have to be making you know significant investments if we're going to tackle some of these issues. I'll stop there because Stuart might have, have more to <laughs> offer about the Court of Madera issue. Well thanks again Warner appreciate okay. it. And I think what I'll do I'll introduce Stuart right now and um, Stuart, did you want to address that question or did you want to say that until the end of your presentation? I'll just capture it along the way somewhere. How's that? Capture what? I'll capture that along the way somewhere. Okay, great. Okay, great. So let me introduce Stuart Siegel. He's been working on restoring the wetlands around San Francisco Bay for over 35 years and has been incorporating climate change adaptation into this work for the last 15 to 20 years. He started this work while an undergrad at Berkeley and received his PhD from Berkeley, studying the geomorphology of tidal marsh restoration. Currently, he's the interim manager and coastal resilience specialist at the San Francisco Bay National Estu Estuarian Research Reserve, a federal program with 29 reserves around the United States. He's also an associate research professor in the Department of Earth and Climate Science at San Francisco State University. He has lived in Marin since 1995 and is known colloquially as Swampy. So Swampy, tell us what's going on. Um, thanks so much, Linda. I'm really happy to see everybody here today. It's a, a great turnout and I wanna to commend Warner on the material he just covered. That's a super important background and context um, for a lot of what's going on and really helps give a strong sense of <clears throat> what the regional issues are and questions and, and big picture strategies and how we can then begin to put those into action, um, including collaboration amongst jurisdictions and also uh, trying to get funding together for everybody. So let me start, I will do a screen share here. I've got some items to cover for you folks and then um, I'll address Corte Madera along the way. Uh, and then some other stuff that might come along as well. Um, so with luck, you now see my screen. Um, and what I want to cover today is get down into the idea of actually doing nature-based solutions on the ground that provide climate adaptation. Uh, it's a real, when it gets to actually making things happen on the ground, it's very complicated. And I haven't even put slides in of the process it takes to get things done. Um, so let me jump in here. And the first thing I want to touch upon is, if my slide will shift, there we go, is focus a bit more on the sea level rise projections. Because when you get into the idea of developing adaptation projects, one of the very early questions is, 
what level of sea level rise do you want to adapt to in your project design, uh, including how much you might want to consider doing at the outset, and do you want to um, be able to raise things or uh, modify them later on in time. So the graph I'm showing here is similar to one that Warner showed, a different source. And, and um, one thing is there's constantly new information in this regard. And so this comes from the, um, the Ocean Protection Council report for the state of California in 2018. And these numbers are for the Golden Gate um, itself. And so the way the Ocean Protection Council looked at sea level rise is this question of risk aversion. So if you're downtown San Francisco, you really don't want to flood the financial districts. So you're pretty high risk aversion to extreme risk aversion. Whereas if you're a farm field in the Delta somewhere, yeah, it might not be, it's not great, but it's not that big of a deal. So you're much lower risk aversion. And so they, the Ocean Protection Council combined um, views of risk aversion with different scenarios of emissions um, uh, around the globe. And so going out to the year 2100, which is the, the benchmark everybody uses, in the lowest risk aversion, a low emission world, the, the projection about two and a half feet of sea level rise of the Golden Gate. At the very far end of that spectrum, with uh, high emissions and extreme risk aversion, would be um, to plan for 10 feet of sea level rise. And so, and then in between, there's different combinations of emissions and risk aversion. And so, it's always important to think about where the places you're trying to protect lands in terms of how much risk you're willing to tolerate. And then from there, deciding which sort of emission scenarios and sea rise projections um, one wants to consider using. <clears throat> Another really important aspect, I think Warner touched upon some as well, is you have to look behind you as well, is that we have a lot of creeks in the water sets here and they flood. And their ability to drain is in part um, the water level of San Francisco Bay, how, uh, how, far, how far down they can, they can uh, drain. And so that, that varies from low tide to high tide. And then with sea level rise, that just pushes everything up further. So this is a picture, for example, of, of um, Highway 37 at Nevada Creek, I think in 2019, that was closed for about a month. And that's essentially the Nevada Creek had so much water in it and the bay was really high and they couldn't get the water out of there. And so the road was closed to get the water out. So there's, um, there's infrastructure things that play in there as well. But designing adaptation solutions is make sure to pay attention to the watershed above you as well as the bay below you. Um, one point I wanna to touch on that came up on Warner's comment that someone raised a question about, I think it's really important to emphasize is reuse of, of soil. And so the question I think was about upland construction derived soil, which is super important as Warner mentioned. And the other is uh, we dredge San Francisco Bay every year. It's about 3 million cubic yards are dredged annually. And that's a combination of ports and marinas. Um, it was all maintenance dredging, not anything new. So, you know, Marin County, they dredge the San Rafael Canal for the boat use, the marinas there. They dredge the Port of Oakland to the Port of San Francisco, Port of Redwood City. So it's about 3 million cubic yards of a year. And historically, all that got dumped in the Bay or the ocean. And a long term effort put together an effort to really focus on trying to reuse that material. But only about 40% of that actually gets used. Um, and so we really need to, to ratchet that up. And, and as long as it's clean sediment, not contaminated and causes problems, that should all get reused everywhere. And there's some effort at the federal level to change how the Corps of Engineers does cost estimates and considers the, the beneficial value of, of reuse in their cost estimates to make it so they can actually say yes to good ideas as opposed to, well, it's 10 cents more cubic yard, therefore we take it to the ocean and throw it away permanently. So that's just a really important thing to keep in mind here. Um, so then start zooming into Marin County here and a couple of places I'll talk about today is, is where we need sea level rise adaptation. And so in essence, um, what this map shows, the key about Marin County that you're all probably very familiar with is we have a topography of, of hills and valleys. And so every valley is low line historically. Um, pardon? Okay. Um, and really take a look at that. Everything that's the, um, the darker blue on this map is areas that are developed lands and diked lands at risk of sea level rise from about three feet. And then if the areas that are more orange or yellow are um, developed dike lands that are risk of, of more sea level rise, about six feet or so. So this is a very, there's many different ways to look at this equation and, and Marin County, the um, uh, Bay Wave did a real deep dive into understanding all the vulnerabilities along the entire Bay Shoreline of, of Marin County, tons of information that report about 
the risks and what's exposed and all that kind of thing is a very valuable report to go to. Um, and um, what, one thing that really means here is we have a lot of urban developed areas at risk. So especially around Cormadera, Larkspur and San Rafael in particular are extremely at risk. Mill Valley a bit less so, um, but there's definitely parts of Mill Valley that are at risk. Um, uh, and so it really gives a sense of, of the level of concern in these areas. Um, and this is just the developed areas. The other aspect is transportation networks, which are a huge deal in Marin County as well. And so I'm going to talk about um, a couple of projects, uh, Arambra Island down in, in Tiburon and Sears Point, which is out of the county, but it's, it's a very, both these are great examples of nature-based adaptation projects, and there's many others. So the other part I want before I get into those two projects is I put a map together, it's probably two or three years old now, and there's a couple more projects of all of the North Bay wetland projects that have some version of sea level rise adaptation designed into them. And as you can see, it's quite a few. Several have been constructed, several in planning stages. Um, I point out that the two SF Bay NUR, the research reserve sites, one is China Camp State Park in, in San Rafael, and the other is Rush Ranch Open Space Preserve on um, Susu Marsh near Fairfield. But you can see there's many different projects that have had um, some versions or, or plan to have versions of adaptation elements built into them. And as Warner kind of mentioned in it with the adaptation atlas, there's a lot of different things you can do and it's picking the right set of, of things to do for any given location and then recognize that you may have to do some sort of hard engineering to go along with some of the stuff depending on the, on the place you're at. Um, so first I'll talk about uh, Arambra Island. So just a sense of where this is located. This is island um, on the east side of Strawberry Point. So Richardson Bay is a large area in the middle there. That's a preserve area. Tiburon to the right and, and Arambra Island is a, a filled part of San Francisco Bay. It was a peninsula connected to that development on Strawberry. It was uh, made its island by a channel cut in the 1980s when the housing development took place and then set aside as a wildlife preserve. So it's a pretty neat area, um, artificial land, uh, but has a lot of functions for it. Um, so one of the things that was happening was built in the 50s and 60s when they developed the housing around Strawberry. And over all those years, um, the whole Eastern shoreline that faced the bay um, had significant erosion problems. And the island itself has wetlands on it, a little bit of uplands, it's a wildlife preserve. And the other thing that it really does, if you look at the map on the left, is you can see this, this channel with a bunch of boat docks there. So the, the island is in essence a natural breakwater for a lot of homes along the east side of Strawberry Point there. So it's just super beneficial to protect those homes from storms in particular. And we were having you know, about 100 feet of shoreline erosion or more has happened since the island was built. And you can see in these pictures, it is about two to four feet of a road and shoreline. And if I kept on going, it would just keep chewing the island away and eventually um, it would get um, eroded away and then with sea level rise would get over top and, and then really start putting all those homes at risk in that area, for example. Um, so what we did was a, a nature-based design here and I'll just kind of go over briefly some of these key elements. The, 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 the thing to keep in mind is the, uh, on this view, the wind, the dominant wind comes from the upper right hand corner of your of your uh, screen and blows against your shoreline so that the more areas on the right get higher winds and then those ease up a little bit as you go to the left on this diagram. And so we basically had a design that was was to build um, uh, natural beaches of different materials going from the, the, the right hand side of the island out to the left uh, and then doing a bunch of what we call mud uh, wood micro growings to try to help create little little cells for all the, the beach materials to, to stay within. Then we did a bunch of restoration on the island itself, this area that's um, kind of yellow dot. We did a lot of seasonal wetland restoration out there as well. Um, but I would talk more about the shoreline part. Um, so you can see in here we use core sediment on the more southern slopes, gravel and oyster shell in the middle, and the oyster shell and sand at the very northern end of this whole design here. So to get a kind of sense of what this looks like, if we kind of start in the middle here, we did some, so some grading of the shoreline. We, we hauled a bunch of material by barge, that's an island, that was all, all cut, came from um, either it was waste material from sand mining in San Francisco Bay, um, or, and then the oyster shells came from a processing plant up in the, in the East Bay. Uh, and then sand also from the sand, the sand came from actually dredging 
the marina at, um, at Chrissy Field. So instead of them disposing that sand somewhere else, they brought it directly to this island by barge. And so once it got dumped on island, we used loaders to spread around. We dumped it into piles on the shoreline and then spread it around a little bit with a small bobcat. And then this picture in the upper right is you give it a few days and the, the, the tides and the wind make a beach for you. So when you build these things, you don't build the beach, you supply the materials uh, of the right size and put it in the right location and then nature builds the beach for you. And it takes almost no time at all for that beach to get built. So it gives a sense here of this nature-based solution that really is simple to do, not necessarily cheap, especially here you had to barge everything out there was kind of complicated. It's shallow water, so it was a, you watch the tides carefully. Um, but literally nature will do that work for you in the course of a few days, make your beach. Down at the bottom, kind of show where the, these, these wood microgroins are is that we use um, mostly eucalyptus trees that were harvested from some um, pg and &E clearing in the area and brought them to the island, cut them to size, and they basically got, got jammed into the ground to make, uh, make barriers for sediment transport. So you can see in the left picture, after we put some of the oyster shell out there, sand got put later, but on the right, you can see how nature has made this beach. And so the groin here acts as a barrier and so all the material comes to that and then kind of stops. And then there's a, another cell further down, it goes around and around and repeats on the island with the design there. So it has worked incredibly well. This place has had phenomenal bird use since it got built. Um, this is a joint project between the Richardson Bay Audubon Center, which is right nearby, and uh, Marin County Parks, which owns the property there. And, and Parks has been doing all the monitoring uh, since it got built about 10 years ago. And so it's worked out very well for a lot of nesting birds out there. And the island is staying very stable right now, which is a great thing. It may at some point need some extra um, beach material added out there, uh, but that might be something that's down the road a little ways. So the next project I want to talk about is uh, Sears Point up in, on the northern shore of San Pablo Bay. And this is a restoration that I did, did the design for about 15 years ago. It got built about six years ago, and we're doing some, some modification work on it uh, this fall, actually. So the, the reason I put this particular image up, this is a the elevation, um, essentially a heat map of the restoration site and the lands around it. So if you imagine going to, when you drive out Highway 37, which cuts across the middle here, you go up and over the hill to where the raceway is. So this is called Cougar Mountain. So it's all to get a sense of, of the mountains there. Everything that's in blue are, are elevations that today are behind levees uh, and they're below sea level. So if the levees weren't there, they'd be flooded. And they're all former marshland. And so you can see that Highway 37 crosses through that area. The bottom of Lakeville Highway crosses through its intersection is right here. Many of you probably driven along Highway 37 and there's a big traffic right there, a very common place. There's also a railroad line that runs along the base of the hills here that, and SMART now owns that, and it's a freight line for the time being. So you can imagine that, that the restoration site, the originally the levee it was all farm field, and the levee was the, the bottom of the picture here. When you restore wetlands, you have to protect everything so that the, your levee you have to build in the back protects the railroad line, protects Highway 37, Lakeville Highway, lots of farmland there. So it's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of land that's protected by the, the levees out there, including the restoration project. Um, so the key in this design here, this is a very, the entire project has been very nature-based from the outset. And so one of the things that we did on the left is kind of a schematic of the different features in the project. And so the key things really are on the orange, the, the whole, the, the new levee that had to be built. The idea is that was a habitat levee. So it was very broad and gentle slope, fully vegetated, and would allow some, um, some elevation rise with sea level for, for the marsh itself. Um, but also provide a lot of habitat between the upper of the levee and out into the bay. You kind of look on the right-hand side, sort of a close-up is this diagram in the lower right, which is the levee trail on top, going down to a very gentle uh, shoreline. Uh, we had some ponds built in there. There'd be marsh, and then offshore a little bit, we had these, these rounded areas called mounds. And, and if you look in the upper right here, kind of get a sense that the levee top um, is the trail, a gentle slope that there's a mixture of upland grasses and shrubs, some transition vegetation down into the marsh, down to the bottom of the site that, that was built was about low tide level and it fills up with sediment very rapidly. And all these mounds out there that were supposed to be vegetated as well, so they become little microcosms of habitat out in the middle. And then if you look back on the left, all these little um, 
dots all over the all over the site. Those are those mounds. We have about 500 marsh mounds we designed over the project and built. And the idea there was that the marsh mounds would break up the wind wave energy. So when the wind blows and the tides high, all these mounds intercept to break up that waves and protect the uh, levee from erosion. And so that's the idea there. Um, and then the other, but what's interesting, which I get to the next slide, is when they built the project, they didn't build it all the way. And so they built the physical part, they did all the earthwork to make the levees, they made the mounds, but the design had managing the site for about two years to get everything vegetated before you open to the tides. And that was eliminated from the project design. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And as a consequence, they had a problem there. And the problem was all those lovely little marsh mounds they had built um, got destroyed by the, by the wind waves within the year. So the bottom right here, there's a little graph that shows elevation of the mounds when it was started. And then within a year, they lost about a foot and a half of elevation. The tops just got chopped off of all of them almost immediately. And they didn't therefore serve their, their function to protect the shoreline from erosion. So the upper left picture, you just see this barren pile of dirt that has been eroded down and lost about a foot and a half elevation. Um, we were very lucky that a graduate student um, at San Francisco State at the Asteroid Ocean um, Science Center did her master's on these mounds and she was out before they started and had this great wonderful plan of watching how well they worked and then instead she, she watched them get destroyed and spent a bunch of effort trying to revegetate them to see if they could be held in place and so in the upper right she came out and planted a bunch of spartina um, early on and you had to put this this um this uh, a rope around to keep the uh, Canada geese from eating it all and then after and it worked very well so after a couple of years you get these little mounds of of, of, veg, of covered vegetation that worked out beautifully and so when you go out there today um, you have all these little tufts of vegetation all by themselves they're, they're probably you know 30 feet in diameter or something like that and there's there's dozens of those out there now surrounded by you can see this picture all of the open water there um, so she spent some time trying to to salvage some of these things, and I'll get, and I'm going to continue to see how what we've been doing lately to address them. Um, the other part that I mentioned is we have the habitat levy, kind of get a sense when it was. This is shortly after it was built, all uh, nice covered in grasses, very gentle slope all the way to the marsh. We had a series of ponds built in there. They were just they were doing beautifully originally, just really as as intended, um, but they didn't last as that um, as we saw before. So this next slide here on the left. This was right as construction was done. Here's the levee trail and this very gentle slope levee went all the way down to the site. And this is right after it was built. So it was covered in rice straw and everything. And then a few years later, we have plants growing in, but you can see the levee is eroded away here. It's been chewed to pieces and we've lost about two thirds of the levee. So the, the levee was about 150 feet wide and about hundred feet of that levee has been eroded away now. So we're down to the last 50 feet. And, and it's an it's ongoing problem. And, and it's interesting that these nature-based solutions is if you don't actually build them, you don't get the benefits of them. And so this is an example where you have to actually do the whole project to get the nature benefits, nature-based benefits. Um, and so now what we're doing, this next slide here, is we are actually under construction right now. We are going to do a new nature-based solution to fix the eroding levee, to stop it from eroding anymore, and to try to rebuild that levee there. So this particular design has a combination of of some brush fence at the very edge of the mudflat, you can see the mudflat in the distance, and that's to break up the, the wind waves at kind of a mid-tide level. You have a lower beach that we built of, of reused uh, bay mud. We put a whole series of logs along the levee, about 300, 300 logs we're putting out there in total. It's almost two miles of levee, and those are either anchored down by wood you see here, or we have um, cables and, and, and subsurface anchors on those. Um, and then we have an upper beach, which is uh, gravel. Um, and then you can see this picture on the right that, that, that in the middle, that's right after it gets placed by the construction equipment. And then a few days later, all that gravel has been reworked by the tides and started to form a gravel beach there. So nature again, does a job for you very quickly. We also kind of see in this picture here where we have the, that vertical erosion, all that's been graded down uh, flat again. Uh, and then we haven't done the revegetation on that part yet. One of the interesting things on, on nature-based solutions is as much as you possibly can to reuse material. So for example, all the logs that we put out here, those were um, given to the project by PG&E as part of cutting trees away from utility lines, some of them by Caltrans. 
Um, the gravel that got used here came from Sonoma County from um, cleaning out creeks for flood conveyance. The bay mud that we used came from the nearby port of Sonoma from their dredge ponds. And then the brush fence that we built with was just from harvesting shrubs on site. And so the only thing that's not um, uh, reused material on this entire project are the cables that help anchor the logs to the ground and then and the wood that the, for the, the wood anchors as well. So it's a really an opportunity to demonstrate the value of trying to reuse materials um, in these areas. So I kind of want to point out, this is a good slide to talk about Corte of Madera, because um, I think folks are probably whoever ride the ferry are very familiar with that whole eastern shoreline edge of the marshland on Corte of Madera that has the same kind of erosion start. It's, it's a very uh, similar to the picture here um, with erosion there and what to do about that. And so that area, Corte of Madera lends itself very nicely to some sort of a, a natural beach kind of design there. So these beaches are Rambo used a beach. We use at Sears Point here. There's been done earlier in San Francisco, up here 94 and Pier 98. Um, so doing natural beaches um, is a very viable strategy for the shoreline protection projects. They're very valuable ecologically. One of the things we've seen at Sears Point um, are a lot of sandpipers using this little um, the, the upper gravel beach after the tide has moved it, were covered in sandpipers the next day. And it's just, it's, it's pretty phenomenal in that regard. And so Corte Madera has the potential to be addressed in this fashion. So you basically um, build beaches on that bayfront side using gravel and probably some bay muds um, and maybe widen it with, with dredge material there. So there's a variety of things that could be used there. And there's been a lot of work to kind of look at that, that area down there. Um, and so it's a real, it's a real possibility. The, the trick all these places at Sears Point, it was kind of easy because we could haul everything by truck. Um, places like Corte Madera, the same with Rambo Island, you have to probably bring everything in by um, barge unless you build a road across the marsh, which has its own issues. So it takes effort to try to figure out how to get it done. Um, but it's you get both the, the benefit to protecting the human built environment and you get these natural systems benefits, which are really important for these nature based solutions. And with that, I think I will stop. And um, if there's any questions, um, now would be a great time. Actually, Stuart, we're going to hold the questions for your presentation till after Kiki's okay. presentation. Perfect. Okay. I will. That slide's great. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Great. I love the, the way the na mother nature kind of takes over and spreads out all the material for you. I, that's so cool. It's fantastic. It's really? designed for nature to do the work. <laughs> really. So with that, we'll go right to Kiki. Thank you so much, Stuart. That was so informative. And looking at the local level, um, our very own Kiki will review a more targeted project. Uh, Kiki Laporta has been a communications and branding consultant, consultant and graphic designer in Marin County since 1995, working primarily with agencies like MCE Clean Energy and MMWD Marin Water, as well as many nonprofits focusing on environmental, climate change, affordable housing, and social justice. And including Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative, Marin Conservation League, and the League of Women Voters. Though a longtime sustainability leader and advocate in Marin under the specter of accelerating climate change and the social disruption that comes with it, Kiki is realigning her work and her advocacy to the idea that fixing climate change, even if such a thing were possible, will not solve our problems. We must also maintain and repair the Earth's natural systems that support all life, while at the same time adapting to inevitable climate change impacts. So Kiki, it's all yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Linda, Nancy, Stuart, and Warner, and all of you who are here. Um, do we have that video ready to go? Ready to go.
You may all recognize this place. This is San Anselmo Avenue in 2005. It's a visceral reaction for me to even look at this video. Thank you. You'll put up the slide for me. Thanks a lot. Got to go back to the beginning. One more. There you go. Thank you. So after hearing from Warner and Stuart, whose presentations are uh, utterly uh, science-based and um, professional from the standpoint of that is their work. This is a far more informal presentation, but I've got backup. Bruce Ackerman, my friend, the mayor of my town, Fairfax, my colleague on our Fairfax Climate Action Committee and, <clears throat> pardon me, the incoming chair of the Flood Zone 9 Advisory Council or uh, Commission uh, is here. And I hope that he will be able to help me in case there are questions that you have that I'm unable to answer. I'm a sustainability advocate and I believe in science. I'm gonna skim over most of the wonky stuff in this presentation and I may even mash up some details and chronology. My main intention with you is to introduce concepts, especially detention basins, as a way to work with nature to mitigate flooding. The flooding that affects all of us, even if we live on a hill, and the psychological and financial cost to our residents, municipal services, and budgets is enormous and affects everyone and we can do something about it. We've seen uh, through Warner and Stewart's presentations, the tremendous forces at work on our coastlines and how those affect us more inland. Um, here in the central Marin uh, Ross Valley, we are facing slightly different um, impacts from uh, changing weather patterns and climate as well as natural forces. I want to say that flooding is awful. I've got direct experience of flooding. My communications agency was on the main street in Ross in 2005. At the time I had five employees and they all had desks and computers and art materials and personal effects and 10 years of work samples in the cabinets. In the middle of the night, 23 inches of water, some of that water that you just looked at, ran through our beautiful studio. I was out of business for four months. I furloughed staff. I took a small business administration loan that I will probably be paying off for the rest of my life to pay them and stay afloat. I had to remove everything from the office, overflowing dumpsters up and down the street, damp brown paper taped to the windows, piles of soggy, muddy, smelly carpet and ruined electronics, dehumidifiers going 24 seven for months. I tried to service my clients from a tiny room in my house. Flooding is not an abstraction. Slide please. Here are some more pictures of San Anselmo in the uh, 2005 flood. It was commercial, residential, schools. It destroyed vehicles, products. The picture on the bottom right is the beloved White's booksmith. Outside of my office in Ross Common, it looked a bit like that. The top right picture shows the high water mark in downtown San Anselmo from the 2005 flood and on top, the flood from 1982. Slide please. Floods keep happening. It's not an abstraction in the future. It's not the slow emergency of sea level rise. It's now. 
It's our topography and the way we have built our towns and infrastructure so that when there's too much water at one time, it has no place to go, but where we don't want it. Floods are measured in terms of flow rates and potential frequency of occurrence. Our current creek capacity provides what's called a six year level of protection. That translate, if, translates, if I'm not vastly wrong, to something like a 1400% chance of occurrence every year. In 2007, our, that can't be right, but anyway. <laughs> in 2007, our Board of Supervisors and Ross Valley leadership created a flood mitigation assessment so that everyone would pay into a fund to accumulate enough money to begin to address flooding. The Flood Zone 9 Advisory Board reports to our Board of Supervisors. An integrated flood mitigation plan has been proposed which would have provided protection for up to a 100 year flood. I'll show you in a minute what happened to that idea. I want to mention that um, analogous to what we in the Bay Area have approved, I think it was measure AA, where every parcel was assessed something like $12 a year to begin to accumulate the money that will be needed to address sea level rise on our coast. The flood zone nine uh, flood mitigation fee has been going on since 2007 and we've been accumulating money there. Having money enables us to ask for money for grants from grants and other, pardon me, federal programs. So that's what is giving us some money to work with. Slide please. Some of the ways that uh, the flood plan uh, addresses uh, flooding in the Ross Valley is to use detention basins. This picture is baseball fields in Oakley, California. The Flood Zone 9 mitigation program was an integrated series of projects designed to work together. Bridge removal and replacement, removal of obstacles from waterways and obstructions from waterways and flood detention basins were proposed to protect Ross Valley from a 100 year flood. When it's been raining for a week and the ground is saturated and a huge dump of rain comes in a very short time, runoff from the hills and higher ground overflows the creeks and floods surrounding areas. A detention basin is an area lower than ground level that is engineered to store excess runoff for a short period of time to allow moving water to flow downstream without overtopping the banks. When the water level recedes, the detention basin releases its retained water into the creek and waterway. It's a mechanism to slow the flow in an intense and prolo or prolonged storm event. Detention basins only have water in them for hours or days. The rest of the time, they are parks, playing fields, gathering places, or open spaces. Slide, please. Here are two more detention basins. One is in Windsor on the left. You can see that it's constructed with a solid bottom and um, uh, gathering space. And on the right, this is Lake Park in Napa. Slide, please. Low-lying Denmark has a lot of experience with inundation. Here is one of their detention basins. You can see that uh, it has been built for its purpose. The water that you see in the bottom only remains in the flood basin for a short period of time. We're going to show you a video, I hope, that will give you uh, an example. Uh, it's an animation of how a flood, the flood detention system would work in the Ross Valley. Here we go. If you can make that bigger, Nancy, that would be awesome. On the left, what you're seeing is uh, the current state 
of our flood or of our creek system in the, in the Ross Valley and San Anselmo area. On the right, this is with implementation of a 10-year uh, flood protection plan. Watch how dramatically the water rises. This is over time and, and these two animations are side by side to show you what happens over the same period of time. This is dramatic flooding for homes, schools, businesses, roads, infrastructure, utilities. Again, just watching this um, low-lying area fill with water gives me a, a crunch in my stomach. Here we are at maximum inundation. And you can see that on the right with just the 10 year flow mitigation going on, um, there's dramatically less water accumulating on the land. Almost at the end. This video and others and a lot more information is available on the um, marinewatersheds.org website. And uh, we will post those links for you in the chat. Slide please. Thank you. This table is on that page that I just mentioned. Um, and it shows, um, it gives us an example that Project planners have very sophisticated mapping and hydrological models that enable them to predict what geographic areas will be protected with the implementation of different scenarios of mitigation. These are cumulative numbers representing real lives, real people's homes and businesses, schools, churches, restaurants, and grocery stores, and so on. In a flood, it's not only the damage of the water but the incredible pressure on municipal services, police, fire, ambulances, and hospitals, and all the rest. Implementing flood mitigation programs saves a lot of heartache. You can see the, the, um, at the top the 10-year flood scenarios, 25-year flood protection scenarios, and 100-year flood protection scenarios. Slide, please. Here's where it starts to get funny. In 2015, Peter Seidman, an excellent, excellent journalist for the old Pacific Sun, wrote this article. It starts out, around the same time that a report came out recommending that the Ross Valley prepare for severe storms and flooding, a group of San Anselmo residents started circulating a petition to block a plan calling for a flood control basin in Memorial Park. This, despite the substantial damage the town has suffered from floods, as you can see on this page, I've uh, blown up, San Anselmo ranks seventh among all communities in California for national flood insurance program claims, and the town of Ross ranks 10th. Slide, please. This neighborhood group was terrific at organizing but not so good with facts. Memorial Park Basin questioned, why should the public Ross Valley flood fee be used and fees incurred to pay for San Anselmo's Memorial Park Playfield dual use project? Is this what voters intended? Petition that they circulated um, had many wrong implications. They stated that the detention basin at the park would only address runoff from their local creek, that it would destroy their beloved park and playing fields, that it would be dangerous and cost the town millions of dollars. They inflamed and frightened the community and collected signatures to put a proposition on the ballot to prevent Memorial Park from being used as part of the flood control program. 
They did not bother to mention that they would also be getting a brand new memorial park and lots of amenities out of the flood project. And they created a lot of distrust of local government and ill will. By the way, flash forward to today, San Anselmo was trying to fund renovations and refurbishment to Memorial Park, but their ballot measure failed. They still have the same old tired park. Slide please. They did get measure D on the ballot and measure D to prohibit flood mitigation work at Memorial Park passed with all its flaws fueled by fear and misinformation and intense organizing by a small group of people. Ironic that they were the ones who claimed negative campaigning on the other side and even called Congressman Huffman ignorant. In this moment, Memorial's Park contribution to Ross Valley's flood control system was lost. Remember those pictures of San Anselmo? Without any one of the integrated projects in flood zone nine planning, the flood protection diminishes. There goes the 100 year flood protection, at least for now. Slide please. The next detention basin to suffer virtually the same fate as Memorial Park was Lefty Gomez Field, about a quarter mile from my house in Fairfax and continuous to contiguous to White Hill School. Here's a Facebook page from this opponent's group. They also ran a website, distributed flyers, planted yard signs, and virtually stormed town council meetings to intimidate and bully council members and the public. Slide please. This is their website. The first sentence here is telling. Large government grants are available for flood detention basins. As a result, stormwater management is big industry. The fact that these structures bring hazards, harm the natural environment, and create new flooding issues is often whitewashed by those intent on building them. This sentence is used again and again in the Save Lefty Gomez outreach. Below on this page, you can see the ballot language that they had prepared in their intimidation and bullying campaign. Slide, please. Well, guess what? The same tactics that successfully opposed the detention basin at Memorial Park in San Anselmo were employed in Fairfax. This page uses the same stormwater management is big industry sentence, but goes even farther in its misrepresentation. Ultimately, the Fairfax Town Council tabled development of Lefty for flood control, and the county purchased the old Sunnyside nursery property for the purpose, even though Sunnyside's capacity to detain water during an intense storm is much less than Lefty's. After the council hearing, David Weinsoff, a longtime Fairfax council member and the Fairfax rep on the Flood Zone 9 Advisory Board remarked, ballot box zoning is a flawed approach to good city planning. Personally, I think that this issue was why he <laughs> retired from the council. We don't really know why these community members in San Anselmo and Fairfax were so opposed to this flood control work, except for potential and temporary disruption to their own lives or a sense of power and influence. We do recognize their tactics, however, and some of these people have been active in opposing other initiatives in Fairfax, including the Victory Village Affordable Housing senior affordable housing project, about a quarter mile from my house in the other direction. Slide please. Nevertheless, we persist. Sandy Goldman and friends of the Cordomadera Creek watershed have been active in the effort to implement flooding solutions. I'm going to read this slide because it encapsulates so much of what we need to be thinking about. 
On one hand, people are demanding action to protect their homes and businesses from floodwaters while sim simultaneously saying, don't build it in my backyard. There is never one simple solution that pleases everyone. All flood control projects will necessarily require changes to our towns and our lives, but so does flooding. The latter is forced on us by the weather. The former can be managed by us if we act appropriately. It's time for everyone to come together to determine what is in the best interest of the Ross Valley. We believe the inhabitants of the Valley are facing a simple choice actively support realistic flood control measures or be prepared to live with widespread flooding. The League, like Sandy's organization, has credibility and stature. Here are a few things to do if you want to be part of the solution. Let elected officials know that you want funding to be used for multi-benefit flood projects. Follow town meetings to get information and monitor public response. We know that we can sense when opposition is brewing and we can be prepared for it rather than letting it infect the broader public mind. Check www.marinewatersheds.org and get on the Flood Zone 9 mailing list for updates. Reach out to credible community organizations like Friends of Puerto Madera Creek Watershed. Participate in a positive way. As Sandy says, quote, it's easy to say not in my town. And by the way, as an affordable housing advocate, that is uh, our biggest red letter. It's easy to say not in my town, but how does that help us solve our flooding issue? And it is our issue, all of ours. We are all connected by the one beautiful, but sometimes dangerous Ross Valley watershed. We must begin to deal with flooding if we are to keep it beautiful, livable and safe while avoiding the widespread damage and destruction of yet more floods. So there are a couple of themes here. Uh, one of them is how similar it is, although we are not talking about sea level rise per se, we are talking about needing to do adaptation to what we know is coming. Um, and we also are talking about needing public cooperation and funding to do what needs to be done. Slide please. So here's what I would like you to feel and know and take away today. Number one, floods are awful. They are scary, dirty, moldy, smelly, dangerous, destructive, and deeply damaging to people and the environment. And they affect everyone. Number two, the Ross Valley has flooded many times in the past. Number three, we have assessed ourselves and created a process to seek additional funding to mitigate flood risk. We have money for planning and projects. Four, public process and environmental law make it easy to stop things and difficult to do things. Some people may have never suffered in a flood. Maybe they are thinking about preserving what they have, like parks. Maybe they just let other people do their thinking for them. We don't really understand what's going on in San Anselmo or Fairfax any more than we understand our national and state politics. But we cannot shilly shally around. Climate change is accelerating and intensifying negative impacts on our built environment and on us. Weather patterns are changing. Where there wasn't rain before, there's now rain. Where there was just the right amount of rain before, now there's too much. We have droughts, we have floods, we have heat, we have fires. Climate change is accelerating and intensifying negative impacts. The longer we wait, the more risk and the more cost. 
Number six, Ross Valley will flood again. Number seven, we have excellent tools. You saw the, the adapt, adaptation atlas. You saw Stuart's maps and the photographs of the work that he is doing with his teams. Science has greatly advanced and we have technology and expertise to reduce damaging flooding. Never forget, informed and active citizens can be a force for good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiki. It was really, you gave us a lot to think about and to um, drilling down to our local jurisdictions and to see, you know, it gives, gives me ideas of how to approach our local people to um, help pursue answers. So um, going to questions, um, let's see. Chris, did you have a question earlier? Did I see? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, Trandon uh, made a comment about uh, they're experiencing the same thing with Ross about negative press from different neighbors not wanting to see it done. That has to be just so frustrating. And I guess it goes from local to national really quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> as far as misinformation goes. It is, a, it is a pattern and um, I did really want to make the point that we as, the, as members of the League of Women Voters, we have the credibility and the gravitas and the stature to be able to stand up, to do the work that we are all doing today. And I thank you, chair, co-chairs of, of this climate committee, uh, helping to bring our membership um, a common core of knowledge about these issues that are facing us and where we meet the road because we inter intersect with government institutions, people, regulation, code, law. And we have an opportunity to, to bring our prestige to a place before, to a place, to a, a group, to a, uh, a, a society before they get, as I said, infected with misinformation. And we've seen so much of this on our national scene and in state government today. Um, we've got to be alert and we've got to get in front of it. So that was really the intention of, of sharing both what flood detention is and how it can work in the Ross Valley, as well as how we can play a part in uh, not only stemming this, this tide of no, but also um, achieving positive benefits for our community. Right. Stuart, do you have any ideas of how um, we could lend our voice to um, the projects you're working on or? Well, that's a great question. And I think, I know that Chris Chu is on, is maybe still on and, and Warner's here that, that Warner made the point that actually doing projects happens at the local scale. And so getting um, things to move forward has to happen at the local level. And I think one of the issues that um, really stands out, I think that Kiki's example with the Ross Valley flood is that there probably was not as much community engagement in the planning side of the equation as maybe would have been helpful and it's basically, we have your answers, um, you know, you need to let us go do them now. And people weren't involved at the beginning, they were involved at the end. And so finding ways to be involved at the beginning of efforts so that whatever is put on the table is something that is not a surprise. Maybe not everybody will support it, but you probably have a much greater shot at support um, by having that early involvement. Um, and that requires going to each city or town of Marin, as well as the county, wherever their shoreline and, and working with, with those jurisdictions to get them to do to take action. And so for example, the research reserve that I work for um, and China Camp is one of our reserve sites, 
we're doing exactly that, working with parks and the county to address the road that floods out there. But we started out with a, a community planning process. And so whatever might get done out there is the outcome of a lot of people's involvement and what might need to be done. And, and, and part of that is, is the why, you know, understanding what the problem is so that and, and how that affects people. So I think Kiki made the real point that people may not grasp what what the effects to them might be of, of, of floods, for example, and therefore they're not seeing the value of the flood protection measures. And so, um, you know, and, and it's finding a way to do it that, that communicates those technical issues in a way to a broad audience is super important. And that's being able to do that and get that foundation laid before you start diving into the, all the solutions. Because human nature, people love to solve problems. And if they get on the wrong track because they're solving the wrong problem, or they get too far ahead and are solving the problems before everybody's on board, there's a problem that exists. That's one of the issues I think that, that jumps in the way of things a lot. Um, and so, you know, really encouraging the different cities and towns and the county to get out in front of things as much as possible and to engage people at the beginning, not at the end of the project, I think is a real strategy that, that should have a chance of succeeding. That's a good, very good point. I like that. Um, and do we have Ann Wakeley? Um, do you have a question? Um, I think I have a question. I'm just <laughs> trying to get my head around all this. I want to thank all three of you for outstanding presentations. Really, really wonderful. Um, but as as we're talking about all these nature-based solutions. And I, I, I truly feel that it is the right direction to go in. I just think about, you know, kind of how we got here. We have messed around so with the shoreline that used to be there. Um, and we have built dams that interfere with, with nature continuing to, uh -oh, we lost to do what it does. Um, okay, well, we'll see so, if we can uh, and uh huh. Yes. Okay, we lost you there for a bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. Oh, it's my internet. So where did you lose me? Well, it's just okay. We're we're, we're engineering solutions to to problems that we kind of accept for things that haven't happened yet. We we were already in trouble, right? Before climate change. Um, became so much of a, an immediate uh, concern. We already had a problem because of the things that we have done to our shoreline. So we're trying to put in place something that, that's natural that to protect something that's artificial in some cases. So is this, is this sustainable, I guess, is my question. I just I worry about, I mean, you, you're gonna put in, you know, nature-based solutions um, and you are counting on nature to sustain that. Is this gonna work? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Aaron, I have to say. <laughs> and the answer is, we don't necessarily know for sure. And so, um, you know, one thing I that more to touch upon a tiny bit, and I didn't put in my talk was that um, you know in San Francisco Bay specifically, we have this combination of rising sea levels and decreasing sediment supply. And so, in the natural world, all the wetlands that used to exist around the margins of the bay, they kept up with the tides over the when the sea levels rose over the past ten thousand years. The marshes kept pace with them because there was sediment in the system. And then um, we added a bunch of sediment in the late 1800s when, um, from all the hydraulic mining for gold in the Sierra Nevadas. I dumped a huge amount of sediment down in the system. We've done a great job of, of turning that, that spigot of sediment off. And so there's a real risk that marshes, for example, just may not be able to keep up. And then that depends on how much sea level rise we have. So you play a game of Sea level rise is going up and sediment supply is going down, but marshes are still building up and who wins that game? And we, the answer to that ultimately is um, 
a function of how well we succeed in, in reducing our emissions and keeping our the, the sea level rise projections at the lower end of those curves I showed and the Warner showed versus the higher end of those curves. And if we end up at the higher end, then potentially the nature-based solutions um, will have to get um, rebuilt a bunch. You know, so we think of the things that we're doing, you can you can basically keep feeding them every 10 or 20 or 30 or years, whatever it might take, which is identical if you took it the alternative approach, is very hard engineering. You know, so so what I didn't put in also is that when you have shoreline risk from flooding, from sea level rise, you can try to harden yourself in place, you can retreat upland somewhere, or you can build yourself up on stilt or something, something vertical, right? And so a lot of what we're trying to do, the Bay Area is a pretty constrained place. Most efforts so far have been to try to protect what we have so we don't have to move out of the way. And that may or may not succeed long-term. And, and so the nature of natural systems approaches will probably require some going back in and, and updating them. The same with hard engineering, unless you build a, you know, super expensive, massive concrete structures around the margins of the bay, which are be very detrimental in many, many different ways, the, the, you have to go back and, and upgrade those things over time, fix them. Like at China Camp, we're looking at, at you know, can we raise the road out of the tides? And, and one of the solutions, one of the strategies is you do some now, you do some more later. You don't do everything right now because it's expensive and you don't know which sea level rise curve will land on. Um, so all this, all pretty much all the solutions will have to be modified going down the road in varying degrees, right? That's that's kind of an essential nature of the whole thing. Um, and the other thing I didn't really mention is a lot of these nature-based solutions, like the Corte Madera marshes are an example, is that's a solution to protect the marsh and also to protect the human built environment. And so that's because that marsh has been eroding away. So it actually applies to protect the natural system as well as the the human built environment. So it kind of goes both ways. We just have more built environment and, and we might pour more money in the built environment side of the equation. Thank you. Yeah, Susan uh, Stop made the comment that Highway 37 planning provides a huge opportunity for community input, whether to pursue a design for Causeway or Lovey is being done right now, whether to stay on existing alignment in Marin or move it farther north is pending. It needs public input and informed public input. So, yeah, and I'm part of that one of those working groups on 37. Ah. <laughs> also, Kiki would like to ask Bruce a question. Yes. And I'm going to yeah. spotlight. I'm going to spotlight you, Bruce. So, uh, where'd you go? So, everybody can yeah. see you. Thank, thanks, Nancy. I also want to comment that um, as, our, as our friend um, Diz Swift, who has spoken to this committee in the past has mentioned, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, we, have, we spend a lot of money on infrastructure projects that are uh, infrastructure and repair and maintenance projects that are not along the continuum of where we want to go. We're spending that money instead of planning for um, the desired outcome. So, the opportunity for integrated planning, just as, as we were describing in the Flood Zone 9 work, um, makes us look at the whole system. But it didn't include um, fixing potholes and repairing pipelines under the street and various things. So we also need to be um, attending to all of our um, uh, public spending and making sure that it is streamlined into the most beneficial um, path. But I did want to ask Bruce uh, Ackerman, the incoming chair of um, our Flood Zone 9 um, uh, group here, what do you see? Do you see opportunities coming forward uh, in the near or medium term where um, the public needs to be better informed and the public can help uh, more positive outcomes to uh, ensue? Well, that's, of course, an impossible question to really answer, but I'll, I'll say one thing that I'm, uh, I'm hopeful about is that we are building one detention basin. It's a very small one, but it's up above Fairfax at the former Sunnyside Nursery. So that'll be a small detention basin, but it will be an example that people can look at. Um, it's 
I think in addition to what Stuart said, and I thought it was very valuable that that it's important to have public input so that people feel and and in actuality have have had a part in the design of the projects. But some of these uh, some of these projects, there's a lot of science to how they're done, and so there's not a lot of choices. It's a matter of you know this is what the hydrology how the hydrology works. But explaining things in a way that people can understand is sometimes a real challenge. And in the uh, in the the things that Kiki showed about how the detention basins that were thought about in Memorial Park or possibly in Lefty Gomez Field uh, were opposed. That I, I was actually campaigning in 2017 and I walked door to door all around town and I heard some amazing stories. Uh, one, one person told me that what she had heard was, and she was, she was in favor of the basin, but what she had heard was that the, uh, the idea of a basin in Lefty Gomez Field would be, was supported by the kayak lobby whatever that is. I didn't know there was a kayak lobby, but maybe there is because there would be water in it all year round. And there was constant fear of kids falling in the water, but there wouldn't be water in it all year round. Uh, so just that simple explanation of what a detention basin does. It's, and and I, I just was thinking as Kiki was speaking that one way as that question came up in the chat, one way to describe it might be to say that the that uh, that picture that Kiki showed, the video that Kiki showed of downtown San Anselmo, that downtown San Anselmo is a detention basin. So there you go. There's one in action. It only happens for a couple of hours. You get this. You, our typical flooding in the Ross Valley is where we have a long rain, the ground is saturated, and then we have one big dump, and it just overflows the banks. So it overflowed the banks into downtown San Anselmo. And then naturally, without anybody doing anything, it goes back into the creek after a couple of hours when that intense dump of rain subsides, it flows back out of the creek. Unfortunately, downtown San Anselmo is filled with buildings and people, and that's a bad situation. So a detention basin is simply a matter of putting, doing something somewhere else that will do that, have that same effect. The water flows into it, then it flows back out of it. Otherwise, the rest of the year it's usable for other things. So I think if everybody really understood that, we wouldn't, we may have a detention basin memorial park at this point and have a hundred year flood protection in the Ross Valley. But that frustration of not having that, I think, is linked with the fact that people got fed, as Kiki said, first got fed a lot of misinformation and fear about what it was. And that coupled with distrust of, of everybody except the people who are feeding them that information uh, ends up being the, uh, leading to bad decisions. So I just, I guess I'm hopeful that when people see our small detention basin, which is scheduled to be finished by next next September, so by the, the flooding season after this one, we're just starting. Hopefully we get through this year without a big flood. Although we're all looking for rain, we want just the right amount of rain, and we want it to be spaced just right. But if we get through this year, then by next year, we'll have that detention basin, which will help a certain amount. Um, we also just just I'll just mention something really quick about the uh, the type of work that that we're doing in the Ross Valley and that's done elsewhere in watersheds. Is there's two kinds of things that you can do. A detention basin can be built anytime, and it'll help everybody downstream from the detention basin. But the other kind of work is widening the creek channel, open, taking out obstructions like bridges and concrete. Uh, structures that have been put in the creek bed so that the water will flow down out of the creek bed more more quickly and be able to not back up. So downtown San Anselmo has one of those obstructions and that's one of the reasons San Anselmo floods so badly is because it the water hits that obstruction and can't go any farther and therefore it comes out of the bank. That kind of work has to be done from the downstream up to the upstream. You can't 
take out an obstruction in San Anselmo right now because people in Ross are very upset about the fact that some people will experience an increased water level if that obstruction is taken out. So you have to first address the issues in Ross or downstream from Ross to let the water keep going past them before you can take out the obstruction in San Anselmo. So there's these orders that things have to be done in that are just, you know, it's just based on physics and um, that tying that together with the political process of when do people want these things to be done and how's it going to affect the other things they're interested in is definitely nuanced. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, more on that. Yeah. Oh, Linda, just real quick, I don't know if yeah. you saw this. Uh, earlier, somebody had asked, where does the water go from the detention basin? So now it's time to let that water out. Where does it go and how is that controlled? It goes back into the stream and goes down the stream. So they just at a slower rate. Yeah, just when when the rain has subsided and the stream can handle a bit more water, then the the water goes back out. And there's actually a couple of different ways a detention basin can be designed. It can be active or passive. So an active detention basin, they'll actually open something up and let the water come into it, and then open something up and let the water out in a in a, a controlled way. And a passive basin is like what downtown San Anselmo currently is. There's nothing that's done. There's no gate on downtown San Anselmo, but when the water gets high, it flows into, into the street. And when the water gets lower in the creek, then it flows back out of the creek. So that's a passive detention basin. We just want it somewhere else besides downtown. Well, great. Thank you, everybody. Any uh, last minute? Any last minute comments from any of our speakers? No, very good. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I know we ran a little longer, but everything was so interesting. Um, I think we all learned a great deal. And I uh, can't wait to see how this all progresses with the years. Nancy, any comments? Muted. Muted. Yeah. You're still muted, Nancy. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to thank all of, the, the, all of our speakers, Warner, who had to leave before, Bruce, for jumping in. Thank you very much for uh, taking care of some important questions. Kiki and Stuart, thank you so much. We've run over, but I think it's all been time really well spent. This is being recorded. We will promote the recording uh, so other people will get to watch it. Uh, we do have a few more things. Uh, uh, so um, if you guys want to go, speakers, I'm going to, un uh, Dee Dee, do you want to unspotlight our speakers? And I just have a few announcements I do want to make on uh, what we have coming up for next month. And I just have to get that up here. So um, November, we haven't got all our speakers confirmed. But what we want to focus on basically is Marin's report card. We've spent this year learning about climate change, how it impacts Marin, what our, our key threats are. So how are we doing with all of this in the end of this conversation? So next month, we want to focus on what Marin's report card looks like. So stay tuned for more details about that. Also, uh, a final reminder that tomorrow night is our last of four Drive Clean with the League campaign events at six o'clock tomorrow. Uh, if you go to the chat, the link to register, which is the events page on our website, uh, to go to that if you're planning on buying an electric car or near future, far future, it's very, very informative. They review the different electric cars that are out there, what the benefits are of one car over another cost-wise and otherwise. So if you have any inkling of wanting to learn more about electric cars, drive clean with the lead tomorrow night at six o'clock. Uh, let's see, also just want to note that the November 1st monthly meeting is being hosted by voter service. Linda Roberts, our registrar of voters um, for the county will be our speaker. She's going to recall uh, recap the recall election. 
and talk more about the Voters' Choice Act in Marin in regards to how this is going to impact how we vote come uh, next year. Also, the different team leaders in voter service will just give a little bit of an overview of what we're looking forward to in 2022 in regards to elections and where we're looking for people to jump in and give us a hand. 